Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on the Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me. Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire. After Sunday's state election results, we asked, are Narendra Modi and the BJP most likely to win the 2024 elections or is it too early to write off Congress and the India opposition bloc? Joining me to answer that critical question to which I'm sure most of you want to hear the answers is the chief editor of studies in Indian politics and the co-director of Lokniti, the program for comparative democracy, Professor Suhash Pal Shikhar. Professor Pal Shikhar, let me deliberately start with a broad question. Sunday was no doubt a bad day for Congress, but how much of a setback was it for the opposition as a whole? And beyond that, for people who are wanting a fundamental change in 2024? Oh, yes. Undoubtedly, it was a setback uh, because they lost both Rajasthan and Chhattisgarh. I think that loss makes the opposition project for 2024 far too tough than one would have expected earlier. In other words, this is a very considerable setback. Yeah. Now, a few weeks ago, Congress was very confident of winning Chhattisgarh and Madhya Pradesh. So is overconfidence responsible for its defeat in both states? Or can Congress take comfort from the fact that its vote share in the three Hindi heartland states has remained almost exactly identical to what it was in 2018. It's BJP's vote share that's shot up. Congress's has not suffered. I don't think that the Congress should take satisfaction merely from vote share. Because here, the game that we are playing is clearly about parliamentary or assembly seats. And therefore, your ability to get those votes converted into seats, that is to say, win seats, is something very crucial. And for that, their vote share has to not only increase, but also increase in such a manner that they ensure a certain number of seats in each state. That has not happened. And in that sense, I think it is a setback for the Congress, both in terms of its existence and its strategy. So when Jairam Ramesh in a tweet took comfort from the fact that the vote share has stayed almost identical, he's actually finding false comfort. What matters is seats, not vote share. And even if your vote share remains the same, if you lose, that is what counts. It's the defeat that counts, not the size of the vote share. You know, in terms of giving some satisfaction to an ordinary Congress worker, he has a point there. The point is, look, our base is there. A little more work is required. If I read the message correctly, and I hope he himself uh, really means this, that it is not victory and loss that he is talking about. He is talking about 2024. And therefore, he is saying that, look, our base is intact. This is something that the Congress party and ordinary workers have to build upon in the next four to six months. The base being intact would only be a matter of comfort if Congress can tackle the problems it faced, which this time perhaps are responsible for its debacle. Let's turn to those problems. Both in Rajasthan and Chhattisgarh, 
Congress was adversely affected by a divided state leadership, which the national leadership failed to resolve for five long years. This is very different to how the BJP tackled its own problems with either Vasundra Rajay Sindhya or Shivrat Chauhan. In fact, Nalin Mehta, the scholar, points out that by fielding ministers and party leaders in Madhya Pradesh, to take that as an example, BJP won 53 of 79 seats, which those people influenced, 18 more than last time. Would you say that this difference in handling its state-level dissidents made a sizable difference between Congress's performance and the BJP's? I think given the type of leadership the Congress currently has, it is going to be its limitation that it cannot effectively moderate state level factionalism. Factionalism is bound to be there. And the problem with the Congress leadership is that it cannot be an arbiter. It has only to be a mute spectator of what is happening. In Rajasthan and Chhattisgarh, they decided to go along with the incumbent chief minister. In Madhya Pradesh, they gave entire charge to Mr. Kamal Nath. Now, this obviously was something under duress. And therefore, I think the Congress's limitation is that unless its leadership asserts itself, it cannot effectively interfere in state politics. But at the same time, it cannot interfere in state politics unless it guarantees a victory with the help of national leadership. If one looks at Karnataka, the leadership of the state was responsible mainly for its victory. And they hoped that that model would work in these three states also, which it clearly didn't. There's an interesting paradox here. Most people from the outside believe that, in fact, the Gandhi family dominate the Congress party. The Congress does exactly what the Gandhis tell them to do. But you're actually indicating that when it comes to arbitrating between divided state leaderships, the national leadership is too weak to do so. It cannot assert itself. It cannot get its way. So there's a certain paradox here between the perception and the reality. I think there is a myth. I mean, there is a truth, of course, that the Gandhi family wants to keep control of the party. But at the same time, let us also remember that the Gandhi family is extremely handicapped in terms of organization and its own ability to win elections. Ever since Rahul Gandhi came onto the scene, he has been trying to assert it himself. And he failed to do that because the organizational bosses from various states hit back. So the model that he sort of adopted was that, OK, you go ahead and win the election. If it works, that is great. And that is not happening. So I think that's a great bind in which the Congress finds itself that the state leaders can't win elections and the national leadership too can't win the election for the party in a given state. Now, the second challenge that Congress faces, which it has to find a way of tackling, is Narendra Modi. He campaigned extensively in the three Hindi heartland states. Do these results suggest that the Modi magic continues to sparkle and attract voters and that the Modi key guarantee, which was his winning yes. slogan, actually makes a difference with people? Whilst Bharat Jodo Yatra, which you and I were praising four or five months ago, has effectively fizzled out. Yeah. I think the crucial difference, therefore, is that while we will keep discussing what happened in Chhattisgarh or Rajasthan or Madhya Pradesh independently, the fact that in every state, this idea that Modi works and Modi is the critical leader of the party has been central to BJP's campaign. And the Congress has been unable to overcome that important hurdle. I have therefore been saying both not only in this election, but earlier elections also, that the victories owe to Modi, just as the defeats are Modi's responsibility. Whether it is Karnataka or West Bengal on the one hand, or now the three states where the BJP has won. Let's focus a little bit more on Modi. In an article that you wrote for the Indian Express yesterday, Monday, you said Modi has the capacity and the ability to be many things to different people all at the same time. I'm quoting bits of what you said. You said he can incorporate victimhood, but also aspiration. 
He can reflect asceticism, but also material acquisition. He can stand for Brahminical vision alongside claiming that he is of lower caste birth. In other words, is this in a sense the core of his seductive appeal? See, what I'm saying here is that Modi, for many people, is only an authoritarian personality. For voters, however, he consists of different images and messages. And it is these messages which are differentiated by the party in its campaign too. So when one talks of Hindutva, I think we are dealing with a totally new packaging of Hindutva under Modi, where these seemingly contradictory messages are very easily communicated to the voter. And that is where the success of Modi, the image, Modi as a symbol, lies. To borrow a phrase which perhaps looks an inept to start with, Modi therefore comes across as a man for all seasons. People see and interpret him as they want to see and interpret him, which is why they're willing to embrace him. Sure. But one must also accept the fact that Modi and the BJP have been successful in combining these contradictory messages. That is what I'm really uh, talking about when I speak about Modi's leadership. Look, for example, Modi's image, and you will find that he speaks in the same breath about Fakiri, about being simple, simple, about being an ascetic, going to Kedarnath, for example, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, he is not worried about the allegations of cronyism that are leveled against him. He is not worried about the opulence of material wealth that is being concentrated in a few hands in India. He can combine the two and still present to the voters. That is something Absolutely. which is happening over the last decade. Absolutely, Professor Parthikar. The image that comes to my mind is Modi making a winning spellbinding speech about Fakiri and yet draped on his shoulder is a very expensive Jamawar shawl. And that yes. combination of contradictions doesn't offend people, they accept it. Yeah, it is this success. And I think this success is not just Modi's success. It's a combined success. So when we talk of Modi, in the sense, it is a shorthand that one is using the term Modi to express this new Hindutva that has emerged of late. And this is something to which the opposition do not have an answer. Yes, right now it seems that they don't have an answer. I think their effort is to engage in a totally different register from Hindutva. And that register is mainly about whatever. The term they are currently using probably seems to be economy, the magic term that they seem uh, would work in the next elections. But there Why is no that? consistency to that. Let's come at this point, Professor Parshikar, to some of the broad themes or strands that were discernible during these five state elections. First, both Congress and BJP put a lot of stress on what Narendra Modi once called raveries. Both parties use them to attract voters, particularly women voters. But why do you think women voters responded disproportionately to the BJP compared to Congress? Was it that largely Behena was more alluring than what Congress was offering? Because on paper, largely Behena only gives 1250 rupees per month. On paper, Congress was offering 1500 rupees per month. It was offering support for daughters' weddings, rural housing for women, and the Bitya Rani scheme of something like 2.5 lakhs. And yet, Latni Bhena won out, and the Congress set of sops and promises did not. Why do you think that happened? Was it communication? Was it the Modi guarantee behind it? I think there are multiple answers to this. As you earlier pointed out, this idea that these are Modi ki guarantees uh, resonates with the voters, because there is someone tangible, a leader and a tall leader who will, uh, who is offering and who will deliver. Behind that, I think there is a larger phenomenon and that larger phenomenon is a popular acceptance of this paternal model of governance, as I would like to call it. This paternal model of governance is where you use welfare schemes as something that you are giving 
out of a paternal concern with the poor. Look at the terms largely vena, as opposed to though Congress itself has forgotten the term, the 2019 Congress term of Nyai. Nyai is more theoretical and ideological, whereas schemes like Ladli Vaina, Modi Ki Guarantee as a term, all these hint at a paternalistic attitude to the voters. I think there is an approval of this rather than an ideologically driven, theoretically driven concept of Nyai for the moment. You're also suggesting, aren't you, that the Indian voter culturally or maybe emotionally is more responsive to what used to be called the Maibab Sarkar than to concepts that are secular or rights-based. Sure. I think that trait has now been consolidated by the BJP very systematically in the current dispensation. Now, a second strand, Professor Pal Shekhar, is what Nirja Chaudhary in one of her articles in the Indian Express called competitive religion. We are accustomed to the BJP's repeated stress on Hindutva. This time, Kamal Nath delivered a very clear Hindu message. Bhagel in Chhattisgarh delivered a very clear Hindu message. I won't go into the details of what they said. That's well known. But the net result is very interesting. The BJP's Hindu message won votes for the BJP. The Congress's Hindu message seems to have been either ignored or sidetracked. Again, how do you explain that? Is it that Hindutva and the Hindu message is so closely associated with Modi that he has a monopoly over it? I don't know. I think what Kamal Nath tried to do in Madhya Pradesh just didn't click with the voters because in Madhya Pradesh, you already have, as you said, something, a dispensation for last so many years, which is already representing all these things. So someone coming up all of a sudden and saying that, look, I will be the same, might not have worked. Uh, also, I think in Madhya Pradesh, more than that, this question about what the government of the BJP has done so far did matter to a certain extent. Uh, the idea of caste census didn't work, mainly because the uh, idea of OBC politics has never shaped in Madhya Pradesh. So all things, in a sense, now retrospectively we can see were stacked up against the Congress, though the atmosphere that the Congress created was that they are going to win Madhya Pradesh. Let's come to caste and the caste census idea. It is something that Rahul Gandhi very strongly promoted in his campaigns. It was a very obvious and eloquent element of the message he was putting across. But 30 years after Mandal won, do you think caste mattered in 2023? Because I notice it hasn't really dented either the BJP's Hindutva appeal or the BJP's OBC vote base. Access My India poll suggests that when it comes to OBC votes, either in Madhya Pradesh or Rajasthan, BJP had a 25% lead over Congress. That's a very sizable lead and it suggests that either Congress's message didn't resonate or Rahul Gandhi didn't find the language with which to communicate it effectively. I think this communication about caste census and what it stands for must have been proved inadequate so far. But at the same time, I would still think that there is some element of possibility there for the Congress to pursue. And I really think that the Congress would take a consistent line rather than using a slogan if it doesn't work, dropping it and going on to something new in the next election. Because not just in North India, but elsewhere also, this question of caste inequality is still there. The difficulty for the Congress is that it has not been able to relate it to the economic distress that people are facing. And as a result of that, caste census becomes merely a kind of abstract idea for the voter. Uh, on OBC support, however, I think I would have to differ from whatever current existing uh, knowledge uh, about OBC vote is, namely that the Congress still managed to hold on to a large section of the OBC vote. It didn't increase its vote, definitely not. But to say that they lost OBC vote is not very accurate. I don't think so. And therefore, there is a possibility for the Congress 
to target the lower half of the society because that is where their vote lies. So if I understand correctly, you're saying there is still a lot to gain for Congress by pushing the idea of a caste census, but it needs to do so by relating that idea to the economic reality on the ground and how it will make a difference to the economic well-being of people. That connection hasn't been made. If it were made, it would provide better results for Congress. Yeah, they need to do these three things. One is they need to project sincerely leaders from OBC sections for the party itself, which they are not doing currently. The second thing they need to do is to come out clearly with what they would do with the question of different backward and most backward castes getting adequate share in administration and power. That is rearrangement of reservations, which is a tough question for them. And the third thing they need to do, as I said, is to relate the caste question to the economic question, because that is where the most uh, invisible connection currently exists. Then and they these, would have some skills. These are presumably not very difficult things to do for politicians. They may not have done it. But to do it would not be a great challenge for them. It simply needs them to concentrate and think through it clearly. Yeah. I think, That's as I said, they need to consistently pursue this agenda over the next few months. In other words, they must persevere. Don't give up. Just because they didn't succeed now, don't throw it out of the window and look for something new. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is not directly related to your question, but the point is, look at Bharat Jodo. You have some goodwill constructed through it, and then you don't do anything about it. Nyai in 2019, and then you simply forget about that idea yourself. So the Congress needs to be consistent in its position and say that, okay, this is what we will try, not just explore, but pursue over a certain period of time. There's a very important message there. Congress often has good ideas. Nyaya was one, Bharat Jodo another, the caste census is possibly a third. But they need to persist. Just because you haven't succeeded the first time doesn't mean jettison the idea and look for a new one. Persist with it because if you do, it will yield results. But that yes. determination, that dedication is what's needed. I think... Now the difficulty is that the Congress also doesn't know whether the India coalition will exist and therefore they would be extremely cautious in taking ideological positions without there is a clarity about that as well. So on the one hand, there is a difficulty in internally uh, as far as the party itself is concerned and then there is this external challenge as if it were. I'll come to the India block and the India coalition in a moment's time. But let me first put one other strand that seems to have emerged during this five state election campaign and particularly in the results. And Mr. Modi picked it up, particularly when he made his victory speech on Sunday night. And that is the way tribal seats have gone. Once again, I'm relying on Nalan Mehta. He points out that the BJP won 18 out of 29 in Chhattisgarh, 27 out of 47 in Madhya Pradesh, 11 out of 25 in Rajasthan, and today's Indian Express says that the BJP's total of tribal seats in these three states has almost doubled compared to 2018. Now, these were seats that in 2018 were almost overwhelmingly with Congress. Why do you think BJP attracted them? Why did Congress fail to hold on to them? What was it that tipped the balance in favor of the BJP? That is really difficult to say because these are both matters of tactic at the time of elections and also long-term approach to various issues. And we, are, we have been saying this again and again. Once a party is, uh, in the sense, pushed to the wall, it keeps making mistakes one after the other. Two more questions about possible mistakes made by Congress before I come to the India block because the India block really is the future. The first is, in the three heart, Hindi heartland states, the campaign was led by local leaders. Ghelot in Rajasthan, Kamarnath, very obviously in Madhya Pradesh, Bhagel in Chhattisgarh. And all three failed to deliver. But increasingly in Telangana, the Gandhi siblings played a fairly sizable role alongside Revanth Reddy. 
in some senses, they were perhaps more important in campaigning than Revan Reddy was. Does that suggest that Rahul has a particular repeat in South India, which he so far has not been able to establish in North India, which is why he was largely kept out of North India? Yeah, I think the understanding is that he is still not able to attract parts of the Hindi heartland as he has been able to do elsewhere. As a result of that, uh, the Congress must have chosen to rely more on local leaders and other leaders rather than Rahul. The fact remains that Rahul Gandhi is still not able to attract voters or at least shift voters uh, in this belt, in the core belt that we are talking about called the Hindi heartland or whatever way one calls it. And that is a limitation because the way Modi has defined the game, you need to have a vote catching leadership. Uh, whether that is good for democracy or not is always a debatable question. But Modi has now turned elections into this kind of personality issues and Congress and the opposition continue to lack that. Why do you think he is less effective in North India? Is it because his fluency in Hindi is nowhere near the same as his fluency in English? Is it something to do with his manner, which is very different to Modi's and doesn't appeal? It's perhaps more Western and less obviously Desi. What do you think it is that holds him back in Northern India? I think that some that has also to do with a long term vacuum that the Congress has created in North India for itself. I, I don't think it is merely Rahul Gandhi's limitation. Of course, the limitations that you mentioned are important. But look at North India, this entire belt, and you will find that since the eclipse of Rajiv Gandhi, and that means now more than 30 years, there has been no leader of the Congress party of the stature who would go beyond the state, a given state, and get votes for his party or her party. Uh, it is this vacuum that the Congress is suffering from. And that is why I think it is not just the limitations of Rahul Gandhi, the person, but also the lack of consistent work by the party and lack of leadership or image over the past three decades and more. So the party is holding him back as much as his own personality and his attributes are holding him back. Both are to blame. Yeah, it is, it is really difficult to say what is uh, holding him back. But it is true that Rahul Gandhi himself doesn't have a clear idea as to how to relate to these uh, voters from Hindi heartland. Uh, he has tried his best so far. But even during the uh, Bharat Jodo Yatra, one would remain, remember that the response elsewhere was much better than North India. A leader would have therefore camped in North India and tried to create some kind of support base for himself in the past six months, which uh, Rahul Gandhi obviously didn't do. One more point about Congress before I come to the India blog. Nagarika Ghosh writing in the Times of India points out that the Congress was very reliant on the guidance and advice of Sunil Kanu Golu as their chief election strategist in Telangana. Earlier, they were very reliant upon him in Karnataka, and both of them were fairly handsomely won by Congress as a result. Famously, Kamal Nath refused to accept Sunil Kanu Golu yes. in Madhya Pradesh, and I'm told that even Gelot was very reluctant to take his advice. Does this suggest that one of the reasons why Congress didn't work successfully in Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan is because they refused to accept the advice of someone who could have perhaps helped them with expertise they lack. Yeah, I think it's not just the person whom they rejected or didn't like, etc. The point is about the old style politics that both Kamal Nath and Gehlot represent as opposed to a more tech savvy politics that has set in now. And that is where the Congress might have lacked in these two states. Uh, however, one may dislike to admit that politics is becoming so dependent on technology. Uh, one has to take into account the fact that that is what matters today. And Kamal Nath and Gehlot didn't agree with this, probably with the confidence that they have enough wherewithal to uh, take on the BJP. 
This is about the difference between Modi 2014, where he was very dependent and reliant upon the advice of Prashant Kishore, and Congress. Congress has been unable to bridge that important gap between the old world style politics and the need for new technical, cephalogical based advice. That's another gap Congress must learn to bridge. Sure, sure. Let's then come at this point, Professor Parshikar, to the big questions concerning the India bloc, because in a sense, that is what's going to determine whether Modi wins easily in 2024 or whether the opposition collectively can give him a real fight for his money. First of all, have these five state elections failed to position the India bloc as a serious challenge? And secondly, do you see the India bloc as a result fracturing? To the first question, I think the Congress is responsible for not really going along with its allies, even notionally. And from that time onwards, there have been rumblings within the India coalition. The second question is probably more important for the future. And today, if one keeps reading and watching the media, etc., it seems that the India coalition is on a brink. Uh, I would still, however, suspect that they would bridge these differences because these are obviously the statements that are being made, whether by Mamata Banerjee or others, are mainly warning signals to the Congress about the future role of the Congress and the seat sharing questions. Uh, once that noise is made adequately, they would probably reassemble. And when they reassemble, in all probability, Congress would have lost the capacity to steer the India coalition any further. And that's my next question, because the logic that will keep them together is a very simple colloquial one. Either they hang together or they'll hang separately. Assuming they accept that logic, how much damage has been done to Congress's prospects of trying to lead this alliance? And secondly, and more importantly, if Congress fails to lead and stamp its name across this alliance, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Many people argue that if Congress is weakened and cannot get its way, there will be better chances of cohesion, of compromise, of being able to fit in other parties into seat allocation shares, and therefore a better chance of putting up a one-to-one -one fight. So. Does the weakening of Congress actually, oddly, strengthen India? On the second question, I am somewhat skeptical because after all, uh, unless a party which is in existence beyond one state does better than in 2019, uh, there is no way the India coalition can take off and become a sizable opposition to the BJP. And therefore, the weakness of the Congress really means, and the inability of the Congress to steer them means that each of these state parties would say that, okay, in our states, we will win whatever seats we win, and we can win those seats even without you, like last time. The question is about the Congress, whether you can win seats without our help. And that is where the problem will begin for the Congress as well as for the India coalition. In which case, let me ask you this, Professor Parshikar, is there a fundamental question staring not just Congress, but each of those parties that make up the India alliance in the face? What is their aim? What is their luxury when they fight the 2024 election? Is it to maximize the number of seats each party individually wins? Or is it to defeat the BJP? If they seek to maximize the seats each party wins, they'll end up fighting against each other and they'll give Mr. Modi a free run. But if they believe that defeating Modi is the main aim, then they will have the grounds and the basis for compromising, for seat sharing, and thus perhaps putting up a one-to-one -one fight that gives Mr. Modi a really tough time. Do you think that is a fundamental question each of them has to individually ask themselves? Sure, they need to, but I think their main aim would be self-preservation. And in that pursuit, they would probably be willing to sacrifice the second goal that you mentioned, namely defeating Modi. Because over the last 10 years, most of these parties have been believing that these are two separate things. Self-preservation, their own preservation 
and defeat of Modi. They think these are two different things. They can coexist with Modi. Uh, I, for one, would argue that they can coexist with Modi for another five or ten years. A time will come when one by one each of these parties would be fragmented or decimated. And that is why they need to hang together. That is my take on this question. But obviously, it seems that the state parties are in no mood to look beyond 2024 at the moment, uh, rather than looking at the larger picture. But then there's a delicious paradox or irony inherent in your answer. If they opt for self-preservation and competing against each other rather than combining to defeat Modi, that quest for self-preservation will anyway put them on the road to decimation, maybe in five or ten years' time. In the long term, self-preservation is not the answer. If the long term is their concern, uniting to defeat Modi is the paramount object. Yeah, there is obviously a paradox in this uh, positioning. And I can understand the basic or fundamental problem they have. The problem is that if their numbers are reduced individually in 2024 and in exchange Congress's numbers increase, then their respective strength in their own states would also reduce. And they are not prepared to uh, that scenario. It would have been much better, therefore, if the Congress has done a little better in these three states where it is defeated. Because a Congress fighting BJP and winning seats in the Hindi heartland would have been the best case scenario for the BJP's opposition. Let me then put a question that arises out of what you've said to you. Given that the BJP now is primarily centered around the Hindi heartland, don't we have a belt stretching from South India through East India all the way to the north via Punjab and Himachal and of course the Kashmir Valley where there is no real BJP in power, there is no real party in power that is close to the BJP. And if the BJP allies with Naidu, even Jagan Mohan Reddy will be out of their grasp. So you have around the southern eastern borders of India, all the way to the north, a swathe of non-BJP territory. And now to that, you can add Mizoram in the northeast, because ZPF yes. has made it clear they will not be allying with NEDA. Does that mean we are a divided country politically? Or does that also suggest that there is a ray of hope because it means Modi is confined to the Hindi heartland and Gujarat? See, the first thing is even in the south and east, and I agree with you that there is this sort of diagonal divide rather than the uh, north-south divide. But in this one must remember in West Bengal, BJP did well last time, though then they lost the assembly. They are in power in Assam. They had been in power in Karnataka. So even if one were to imagine this divide, it is in this divide that the BJP has been able to enter into the other territory, whereas it has been extremely difficult for the Congress, as we have been discussing, to enter into the BJP territory so far. And that is where the catch remains, that the BJP has consolidated its position and is now in a strategic position to gradually enter into this remaining territory. It is only a function of historical existence of the Janasan and the BJP, that they were never strong in these regions. So it will take a little more time, maybe one more electoral cycle. If they are allowed their way, they will be already sitting pretty in Odisha, if not elsewhere. I hear what you're saying, that it's easier for the BJP, which has consolidated itself in the Hindi heartland, to make inroads into territory where the opposition is in power than the other way around. It's more difficult yes. for the opposition to make inroads into the Hindi heartland because of the strength and intensity of the BJP consolidation. But my last question is this. Given that the BJP's consolidation is really in the Hindi heartland and south of the Vindyas, they don't win many seats, if any at all. And obviously Gujarat as well. Can the opposition reduce the BJP to under 272 if they win a few critical seats in the north? There I would agree with you entirely that in 2024, there is an interesting possibility that there is a saturation in the Hindi heartland that the BJP has reached. 
and therefore it is unlikely that it can further increase its strength the only thing can happen is they would reduce their strength a little bit everywhere if therefore the india coalition works efficiently then in the south and east region that we have talked about they would ensure that the bjp doesn't gain any further but loses like in west bengal for example if that happens then if nothing else the minimum that would happen in 2024 would be there would be uh, a battle for the bjp on its hand to ensure the majority in the lok sabha that that is where we stand currently about 2024 that the first aim would be to bring bjp below 270 for the opposition of course let me put it metaphorically it looks very dark but if they work effectively strategically there is a light that they can actually shine and clarify the darkness if the opposition works strategically and one reason to believe that and you made this point yourself a moment ago that everyone is depressed by the fact that the bjp has swept the three hindi heartland states but in lok sabha terms those states comprise 65 lok sabha seats and 62 are already with the bjp so winning these at state level may not necessarily increase the number of seats they get in the lok sabha level because they already have them oh yes that is where the battle would still go they have to win seats in this region and ensure that in south and east they retain the india coalition coming back for a minute to the india coalition you know the point about the india coalition has always been understood as if it is a national coalition in reality it will have to be a coalition and i think we discussed this earlier also a state wise coalition uh, in every state where a party is strong it will have to be considered enough space other parties taking a small share and thus it is only in this region that we have talked about where the india coalition matters in the rest north and west parts of the country the coalition matters less and the performance of the congress would matter more absolutely sir we have no idea how the congress will perform in those 190 seats where they face one to one against bjp particularly in the hindi heartland chances are congress will lose yet again but if the bjp can be constrained in bengal where it had 18 seats and in bihar where it had 17 seats yes and those are seats that are very much in the hands of the coalition then the bjp could find that instead of 303 they could be 30 or seats poor that is where the chances of getting something back in 224 look not bright but possible that is where the tweet that you mentioned by mr jairam ramesh comes back into the picture that this 40% votes that the congress has been able to keep together for itself will have to convert into at least a few more lok sabha seats than the last time last time it was this one practically nothing non existent if now the congress really makes a calculated effort to convert these votes into seats which is where the cephalological uh, support and technological support that we talked about would come back into the picture if the congress does that then the congress has a chance of uh, at least reviving some hopes for itself in that region let me put it like this if the india bloc can deny bjp several or many of the 18 seats is won last time in bengal several and many of the 17 seats is won in bihar and if in addition they can win a handful of 10 or 12 in the hindi heartland the bjp could be facing serious trouble many ifs but yes yes it is very much a game of ifs and buts but that's where psychology and television discussion become terribly interesting we can't point to facts we can't say with accuracy this would happen but we can suggest possibilities raise questions and set people's minds thinking and i thank you professor parshikar for doing that so brilliantly with me today you open people's minds to the possibilities that lie ahead and if i can be metaphorical yet against at a time when it looked as if things were very dark for the opposition's future there are a few signs of light on the horizon that you have illuminated for us thank you very much indeed thank you very much thanks that's was pleasure
Thank you, sir. This should go up. Hi, I'm Karan Thapar. Over the last few years, I hope you've been watching my program, The Interview on The Wire. During that period, I've interviewed doctors, politicians, businessmen, scientists, authors, and even the occasional Nobel laureate. For me, it's been exciting. I hope it's been enjoyable for you. But these, as you know, are tough times. And if this program is going to remain bold, independent, and sometimes even defiant, then I think we need your support. At the end of the day, it's a truism, but editorial independence is best defended by the viewers. So if you would like this program to remain the way it is, forthright, outspoken, and interesting, then would you consider supporting us? All you have to do is to click on the description at the bottom. But more than anything else, I hope you will continue to watch the interview. Your viewership means an awful lot to me.